Yeah, how's everybody doing today, huh? Yeah, give your neighbor a high five, tell them, man, you look good today. So glad you're in the house of God. Hey, it's awesome to have my mother in church today. Uh, mom, everybody say hi, mom. Yeah, it's good to have you. We love you and uh, continue to pray for her with my dad and the loss of my dad. And, and I know she's doing well, but it's kind of tough sometimes, right? And it's tough for all of us. And, and, uh, but it's glad, I'm super glad you're here, mom. Love you so much. Uh, hey, on June 1st and 5th, uh, we continue to talk about looking forward and uh, we're going to have a special weekend that weekend. Um, and we've been giving towards sound and students. Uh, you can look up and see some sound panels here, and uh, we still got speakers coming. That's because of your generosity. Generosity, Thank you for that. Uh, somebody sent me a picture on Wednesday, one of the youth leaders, and said 100 plus students on Wednesday, and God is just doing awesome things. Give God praise for that. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. And uh, we're going to do an open house over there for that and receive another offering for that on the 1st and the 5th. And so we're looking forward to the looking forward. So, hey, uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, grab them. Proverbs 22.3 has kind of been our, our core verse this, this week in this, this series. And it says this, that a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. And then it goes on to say the simpleton or the fool goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. And we've been talking about in the right of faith, really navigating ahead of time. Uh, that the, it's a pre-decision series that I'm going to decide uh, some things in my life that I'm going to do in my faith so that I can, kind, that I can avoid danger and, and have a life of blessing. Not a life free of issues, but a life of blessing. And so we've been talking about, the, you could do six, you could do eight, there's, there's many more, but we kind of chiseled some down to six. And the point is, is that God has more for you than just receiving him. Uh, that there's more to encounter, more to know, more to see. And I would say that God never intended for you to stay where you started. And that, that, that there's growth in that, and there's life in that, and the best is yet to come. The best didn't happen when you began to know Christ, the best is yet to come. I want to do a survey today, and I want to practice real quick, a couple surveys today. First survey is this, um, uh, we'll practice, how's that sound? If, if, you, uh, if the answer is yes, I want you to raise your hand. So if you love Jesus, raise your hand, would you do that? Well done, good job, golf clap. Um, okay, so here's the real deal. So here's the, the start of the survey, how low do you get before you refuel? Like how, how low do you get? And, and so... Uh, how long do you wait, right? So here, here's the first one. I wait till a quarter of my tank is gone. Raise your hand if that's you. Let's see you, uh, you, you overachievers. Number two uh, is I wait till I am like uh, a half. A half, I don't like to go any below half in case I'm stuck in traffic. Okay, here's the third one is, is when it gets down to, th uh, all the way down to a quarter being left, that's when I refuel. Fuel, let me see your hands. Uh, how many of you would say, uh, I'm on fumes, the engine light is on, come on somebody, give yourselves a hand, right, living life on the edge. Okay, so here, here's the final bonus, uh, if you have ever uh, ran out of gas on the side of the road, stand up, would you please do that, let's see, yeah, yeah, God bless you, right, wave to your neighbors, right, this is a big deal, uh, thank you for, for running out of gas, and uh, you comfort me. Uh, I just want you to know that. Uh, I love that there's a, a rose of parades uh, on, on New Year's Day. And, and a, a, you know, I love, I, I don't love parades. I, they're okay. I, I, I'm okay with parades. But I, I think they're neat and they're pretty. And people work on floats and they throw candy. And kids, kids like them. And it's great. But uh, on this particular New Year's Day float uh, day, one of the, the floats ran out of gas in the middle of the parade. Sputtered, and, and the whole parade comes to a halt. And, and what was interesting about it is, is who the float was. It was the Standard Oil Company's float. <laughs> and I'm thinking, that, that's, that's like our lives, right? I mean, here we are as believers. We have all the resources that God offers to us, but yet sometimes we sputter. And we stop. And, and I want to talk to you a little bit about this idea of, of what it means to run on E today. And I would say for many, more is going out of the tank 
than that's coming in. Isn't that true? I, I mean, I would say that. In fact, look at this, look at this verse. It, I read this verse this week, and it, it jumped off the page to me, Job 9, 25. It says, my days go by faster than a runner. They fly away without me, my seeing any joy. Isn't that just like, like I, I'm going so fast in my life. Like I'm moving at such a pace that, that I, I don't know when the last time it was that I had joy or I have joy on a very limited basis. And if that's you today, you're in, you're in a company of many, I, I would say that, that the, the last statistic that came out is that the average American works 8.6 hours a day, seven days a week. Now I know that there's some people that are not working, which means that they're dragging the average up. There are people that are working 10, 12 hours a day. And I look at that, that, that 62% of Americans would classify themselves as burnout. And I'm thinking about what that means as believers, and, and, and I'm thinking about what it means to run on fumes or run on in our lives. I, I look at Luke 21, verse 34, it says, be careful. It's a warning. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, with drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. That the reality is there's a way of doing life, even as believers, that, that we don't realize it before it's too late. In fact, we, we run on fumes and then we wonder in our lives why our marriages or why our relationships are on the side of the road. Why they're broken, why they're hurting, why, why there's no joy, why there's a joy famine. I love the story of, of a... A guy that was driving behind a box truck, and he was completely enamored by what was going on uh, because every stoplight, the driver would literally get out, run to the back of the bus, back of the truck, and take a two by four and smack the back of the box. And, and, and two and three times he did this until the person following him was able to kind of ask him quickly what he was doing. He says, Man, I can't talk. He says, I got four tons of canaries in here, and it's only a two-ton truck, and I have to keep half of them flying at all times, and then he runs back in the truck. I'm like, that's isn't that just life, right? I mean, I'm just trying to kind of keep things, in, I'm, I'm trying to keep, keep things floating. I'm trying to keep things in the air. I'm trying to, like, I'm, I'm just trying to, to, to survive life. I, I've got, like, soccer schedule and baseball, and I'll tell you, as Minnesotans, this is the worst time of the year. Right, because we're running and gunning. You only get like three weeks of summer around here. And so uh, <laughs> it's a great three weeks, but it's only three. No, I love Minnesota. I think it's great. If you don't like it, leave. Uh, it's just awesome. I, I love it here. It is good. I could just take like one last month of winter. Anyhow, look at Matthew 11. It says this, are you tired, worn out, burn out on religion, come to me. I think it's interesting how many times this text says me or I. Obviously, there's something uh, there's someone saying that because Christ is, is the centerpiece of fruitfulness in our lives. Look at this. It goes on. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. I love this phrase. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live, look at this, freely and lightly. And I'm thinking that, that's exactly what living with Christ is and should be. And I look at my life, to be honest with you, and there's times and moments and seasons of my life that I'm looking and I'm saying that is not light and free. And, and I know that the truth is, is that God gives me everything I need to do what he's asked me to do. And if, I'm, if I don't have enough time, then perhaps I'm doing something that he hasn't asked me to do. And I've never met an apple tree. When I walked by it, I heard it grunting. Oh, I'd never heard it before. But it's interesting how an apple tree simply abides and how the abiding produces fruit. And what I'm going to talk today about is, is probably contrary to culture, but it'll change your life. In fact, over and over again, Jesus said, John 10.10, 10, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. That the life of Christ and serving him, one of the benefits that you and I have is a life that's fueled. A life that's on full. A life that, that is, is abundant. Here's John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Then look at this. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Don't think that you can have an abundant life, a full life. I, I don't even care if, if you're not even, uh, if you're a believer or you're an unbeliever, that's irrelevant. But go ahead, Jesus is saying, go ahead and try to have something without me. Because then it goes on to say this, this is to my Father's glory that you'll bear much fruit. In fact, when you abide in me and you keep me center, I'll show you how to live ill. I'll, I'll, I'll not lay anything too heavy on you. I'll show you how to live freely and lightly. And, and also, you'll li live a life of abundance. And, and I'll be honest with you, sign me up for that. Because all I see around me is strain and hustle and, and over, over anxiety and over depressed and all of these things. But Christ's life is so different. What do I do when I'm running on E? It's a great question. Like, what do I do spiritually if I have no fuel in my tank? What do I do relationally if I have no fuel in my tank? What do I do financially or, or socially when I have no fuel in my tank? What do I do when, I wore, when I'm worn out? We're going to talk about that today. It's a great question. And I want to give you a couple disclaimers before we get into it. Uh, disclaimers. The first one is this. There's four. Uh, the first one is this. It's not a one and done. Uh, yesterday I came home from a wedding and my cows were bellering. I'm like, guys, do you talk to your cows, I talk to mine. And I'm wondering, why are you, you I don't understand, I just led them to, a, a, to pasture, some green grass, and, and, and I can't figure out, I'm like, I felt bad for the neighbors five miles down the road, that's how bad it was. And so I, it dawned on me, I checked their water, their water's there, and I, I walked out in the pasture, and all of a sudden, they ate the grass down to the dirt. And I looked at him and I said, I fed you once, I should never have to feed you again. <laughs> no, it's not true, right? I mean, there's certain things in life that it's not a one and done. And what I, I want to share with you today is not once you do it, then you're done. This is what we call the rhythm of faith. That there are things that we do, and, and, and oftentimes we, we preach and we teach on things because obviously some of these things leak out of us and we need them to be put back in. Things that God has said, hey, if you want me uh, and you, you want a life that, that's free and light, you've got to continue to do these things. Not just once, thinking that you're done for a lifetime, but, but you have to continue to do them. Here's the second one. Number two is there's nothing someone else has that you don't. Like, like when it comes to a full life and you're looking at people and you're like, that's a full life. Like that, that's a life that I would esteem to have. That's a life that, that I'm kind of jealous of. They, they have no different access to certain things than you do. They don't have a spiritual flux capacitor. Back to future, right? Just, so, just it's a good movie. It makes time travel possible. They don't have something that they're hiding that is a secret because all of us have the same access to the same things. Here's the third one, things of faith are simple. It's so interesting how we, we, we look at the Bible and then we complicate it. That there's only a few things that we, we should do over and over again in a very simplistic way that bring us monumental rewards. Here's the fourth one is this, I'm a recovering speed addict, how about you? My name is Heath Beard. I'm a recovering speed act. I, I'll be honest with you today. I'm preaching to Heath. Y'all are just listening. I know. That's me, buddy. I feel it right here. Oh, buddy, I know. I, I'm the same way. He's a recovering addict. I'm rec I mean, I'm just saying. I, I understand. And, and I, what I do is, uh, to be honest with you, some of what I share with you come from the brokenness of my own life. And the, the, a guy four or five years ago came to me, and one of my good friends, he said, Heath, you can't do things at the rate that you're doing. you got to quit. And, and I would like to say from that moment on I was completely healed, but I'm not. And, and, and I'm trying to figure it out. And the, the older I get, the busier life gets. And I'm so grateful for what God is doing in our church. It's, it, it's a great thing, but it, it, it's stressful. I, I, there's, you know how life is. That with everything you gain, you lose something. And the tragedy is, I don't want to gain the whole world, yet lose a relationship with him. And so I would like to sit here and tell you today that I'm preaching because I've mastered it quite the opposite. I'm preaching because I stink at this. And that maybe somewhere in my brokenness and kind of your brokenness, we can figure this out. You do know that I'm not the perfect pastor, right? I mean, my mom didn't have me and said, welcome, pastor. I mean, I just... I was born a person just like you. 
Thank you, God. And if you were looking for the perfect pastor, this ain't your church, baby, right? So, I'm, so here we go. How do I refuel? Number one, here it is. Take the scenic route. It's what we call the fuel of, of Sabbath. In your notes, it's rest. I, I'd prefer Sabbath. Change that this week. And, and, and how many, I mean, I, I'm like, I'm never taking the scenic route. Because in my mind, I'm always looking for the quickest way. How about you? To take the scenic routes are, are for, no offense, but they're for grandma and grandpas that are retired. I am not retired. I got too much to do, too many things to see, right? And, and, and it really speaks to, to this idea of, of hurry. And, and uh, why, uh, why am I in such a hurly, hurry? Where, I, I, it's, it's the place, that, the route that you take when you have nothing else to do. Uh, that's the scenic route. And, 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 and I want to tell you today to take that. And what that means is, is this fuel of, of, of relaxation. Jesus never ran anywhere. He always walked. That there was a, simply a relaxed concern in his life, a, a method by which he lived life that, that when he says, come to me, we should really listen to that. Uh, here's another survey, last survey. Um, how, how do I know if I'm in a hurry? It's a great question, right? How do I know? If, let's do a busyness diagnostic today, okay? Uh, so again, raise your hands if it's a yes, okay? Here, here's the first one. Number one, I cut through a gas station in order to avoid a red light. Let's see a yes. Confession, Right? Number two, here it is. How do I know if I'm busy? Um, I, I, I don't go, I, I don't remember the last time I went a whole day without my phone. Let's see it. Come on. Oh, yeah. Got you there. Number three, I, I uh, often look at multiple screens at one time, reading the news, watching a game. Yeah, come on. That's a lot, man. That's a lot of us. Number four, um, people that talk slow irritate me. Let's see your hand. Yeah, I'm like, today, Jonah, right? I'm like, yeah, let's get with it, man. I just, I, I don't, I'm like, you get it. Number five, I often switch lines in the store because I, I'm, I want the one that's the fastest. Come on. Like, I don't know about you, but I'm assessing. Like, I'm assessing, like, how are they paying cash or check because the check is longer. I'm, I'm, I'm assessing the cashier themselves because I think the uh, speed looks a certain way, right? And then I'm assessing the person themselves. How, how much is in their cart and how fast are they going, right? Come on, like that, I'm crazy, I get it. Oh, here's the next one. Number six, last one. I feel compelled to leave church early to beat the parking lot rush. Let's see your hands. You don't need to, we know who you are. Oh, man, uh, it's hard for us to slow down. And we think hurry's productive. We think it's efficient. We think it's evidence of importance that it leads to more fruitful life. It doesn't, right? In fact, a, a 17th century priest said the one who hurries delays the things of God. Um, Psalm 46.10 offers the other solution, be still. Be still. I don't want to be still. I hate being still. How about, how about you? I, I, I like to be on the move. But if I'm going to know him, I've got to learn the power of stillness, the power of Sabbath. Be still and know that I'm God. Do you know in the early years in America, they had what was called blue laws. In fact, they date back to 1610 where Sabbath was mandatory and working on the Sabbath was illegal. In fact, George Washington when he was president, newly elected, he was moving from Connecticut. He was driving from, or not driving, he was going from Connecticut, he was not driving, Connecticut to New York. And he got in trouble for traveling on the Sabbath, the president. I, I love the story of uh, James Armstrong that in, the, in the 1800s in Arkansas got fined $25 for digging potatoes on a Sunday. John Meeks uh, also got in trouble on for $22.50 for shooting squirrels on a, on, on a Sunday. He got fined $22.50 for shooting squirrels. I'd have shot something else, but it wasn't squirrels. It was him working on the Sabbath, right? Biblical Sabbath is a 24-hour day, uh, a block of time in which we, we stop our work, we, we enjoy our rest, we practice delight, and we contemplate God. And for the hurry addicts in the room, the speed recovery, you're going to hate me today. Because I hate me, right? I, I, th this is the last thing I want to hear. But hear me when I tell you that there is something exponential 
about when you find a rhythm of Sabbath. What we're doing right now is in the hand of God. And it's not the Sabbath hour, it's the Sabbath day. Right, here's Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And there is a difference between working from our rest and resting from our work. So as believers, we have a different rhythm than people that are not believers. Here's the rhythm of, of a typical, we should, uh, the typical rhythm of an unbeliever. It's work, 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 exhausted rest. Work, 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 exhausted rest. Here's the rhythm of the believer. Sabbath, rest. Work, work, Sabbath rest, work, work. We work from our rest, not from our rest, from our work, rather. We don't rest from our work. It's something that that is so interesting in our minds. It's so countercultural. And and here's a few things. Number one, we stop work. Listen to this. Um, We talked about it. Mark Buchanan says this. The Sabbath is about trust. It's about trust. It's about turning over to God all those things, our money, our work, our status, our reputation, our plans, and our projects that we're tempted to hold tight in our own closed fifth. On Sabbath, we embrace our limits. We let go of the illusion that we are indispensable in running our world. We stop our work. It's a trust issue. God, you, you can, you, if I take this day in our gut, I'm going to lose a whole day. But God says there's a supernatural exponential thing that you tap into when you do that. That he'll help you do in six what everybody else is in seven. That's powerful. And if we could wrap our minds around this supernatural, exponential, powerful principle, it works. Number two is we rest. To walk with God, we have to go at a walking pace. We engage in activities that restore and replenish us. We jump on the bed. Thank you, God. When was the last time you jumped on your bed? That replenishes me. Your assignment today is to go home and jump on your bed for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Try to do it with a straight face. Now I dare you. Number three, we delight. There is a... uh, There is a a phenomenon in psychology called anhedonia. It's where we are so overstimulated we can't enjoy simple pleasures. In fact, a doctor of neuropsychology said that delighting in the everyday pleasures of life actually restores and replenishes the overstimulation of our brains. We, We replenish by delighting, delighting in the things of God. And our team here... We call it delightful diversions. Like, what are you doing for delightful, for delightful diversions? Things that really don't make sense, but you do them. Like delighting. Like delighting in what God offers for you. Like, when was the last time that, that you, you saw God uh, in, in a way that you'd never seen him before because you were looking long enough to see things? And you were listening long enough to hear things? Number four, we contemplate. Pondering the love of God means that Christ is center of the Sabbath. We're not taking time off from God. We're drawing close to him. Sabbath is an invitation to see the invisible in the visible, to recognize hidden ways God's goodness is at work in our lives. We're intentionally aware of ways that God loves us and the things he has given us to enjoy. Do you know how good God is that he's given you some things to enjoy? Man, that's a big deal. We, 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 we contemplate and we see God in those things. So take the scenic route. Stop, rest, delight, contemplate. If you don't hate me yet, you will now. Number two, find the fast lane. The fuel of fasting. Wait a minute, you said don't hurry. Now you're telling me to hurry. It's a different fast. It's actually the, the, the idea is the, the, the idea of fasting things that, that we would say no to that gratify us so we can say yes to God. And oftentimes at the core, it's a lot of times a food, it's a, it's a diet thing, but there's a spiritual connection to it. And some people, I, I've preached, you know, I've almost been pastoring, I'm closing in in 20 years. I can't tell you how many times people approach me and they say, I've never heard, I grew up in church, never heard about fasting. And what, what's interesting about fasting is, is fasting fast tracks the work of God. 
It fast tracks the work of God. Look at Isaiah 58, which is a whole chapter on fasting. It says, then your light will break forth from the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. When you fast, God shows up in a way that he wouldn't otherwise show up. If I was a business owner, if I was a person in any industry, I would make it a, a, a part of my repertoire to be a person of fasting. Fasting, I believe, gives you the competitive edge because it invites God into your life in a supernatural way where you're a head and tail above your competitors. Even if you're not, in, just in any industry, you label it. When you begin to fast, you do things in a way that invites God into the scenario. Going without, God, I'm serious. I'm showing you, God, that I'm interested. It adds fuel, I'm telling you, to your faith. I don't think so, try it. I'm telling you it does. It says no, no to food, yes to God. No to things that gratify us, yes to him. It shows the, to be able to see the supernatural goodness of God in my life. It fast tracks, it expediates. That's why it's the fast lane. You want to go farther, faster than fast. Number one, here it is. I'm going to give you a couple things. Fasting brings nearness. The Bible says in that same chapter, verse 9, then you'll call and the Lord will answer. Man, I love when God shows up in my life. God delights in showing up in my life. I mean, I mean I, there's moments in my life that, 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 that I haven't felt God like I should. In fact, I've told people to ask me, oh, man, I don't feel God. Then you should fast. Because the Bible says if you draw near to me, I'm going to draw near to you. Here's what the psalmist says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Do you know when you magnify something, I remember as a kid, I loved to magnify with a magnifying glass. And you put it over an ant, that ant just like grows. Isn't that cool? Like it just, phew. but, but the, the item that you're magnifying didn't get bigger. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. When you magnify the Lord, it's not that the Lord gets big. He's already humongous. It's that my vision gets bigger and I see him as bigger like he already is. It's that that I, I see clearly when I magnify him. And so it, people say, man, God really moved. Listen, it's not about God, you moved. See, God's already ready to move in your life. He's all in. He, he sent his son to the cross. He's ready to move in your life and touch your life. He is available to you. But what happens is, is fasting gets us on the same page as him in a willingness and desperation to have him be close. It's not that he's bigger. It's that you see him as he is, clear and big. Here's number two. Fasting brings humility. Brings us to the end of ourselves and the beginning of him. Psalm 35, 13, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself of fasting. We can do things for ourselves. Man, man, can't we? I mean, we're taught, like Western culture, like make yourself, do yourself. And, and that's good stuff. And I appreciate the ethic, work ethic in that. If we work hard enough, hustle enough, do the right things, know the right people, if we're smart enough, we can make it happen. And we can find ourselves settling for the best that we can do and never get to see the best that God can do. So fasting says, God, I know that I can do pretty decent myself, but I need you in my life. Number three, fasting brings favor. There's just something about favor. In fact, before I even knew what favor was, when I was a teenager, I began to pray, God, give me favor. I was so intrigued by Jesus who gained favor with God and man, with God and people. And my whole life, up to probably 14, 13 years old, I said, God, give me favor with people. And he's done it. Because there's something about favor that gets you doors open that nothing else can do. There's something about favor that allows you to have opportunity that nobody else gets. That's the power of favor. Favor comes from the word favorite. Right? You ever had a favorite sibling? Jerks. Favorite. I'm going to be God's favorite sibling. I tell my kids all the time, you're my favorite. And the other one I hear and said, you said that to me. I said, what's wrong with having more than one favorite? God has favorites. I want the favor of God. Nehemiah is a great story. In fact, he wanted to build the wall. He was crying because he heard it was, that, that it wasn't happening. He fasted and it changed the mind of the king to be able to build the wall. See, f fasting can give you favor. If you, need a, if you are getting ready to submit an application, you need a job interview, you need a client to sign on. You, you, listen, you need to fast. Fasting brings the favor of God. Number four, it brings direction. 
bring, man, so many times in my life I needed, I came at a crossroads. God, what do I do? I remember when we, we were deciding to where God was going to bring us. Do we move here? God, we'd move up in the north woods. We were looking at churches and praying about God's next step. Fasting was a part of hearing God's voice for bringing us here. And there's moments in our life we agonize. And I will tell you that, that, that some of us, if we don't fast, could possibly make the wrong decision. Fasting brings clarity. I love Acts 13. They're selecting leaders and they were fasting. In the process of them fasting, they set apart Saul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them. While fasting, it brings clarity. Live in the fast lane. You say no to gratification and yes to God. Number three, last one. Drive the service road. It's the fuel of prayer. Service road is a road that really has utilities. It has useful things like energy and power. And oftentimes the people of God are, are disconnected and, and from those things. And that thing is what we call the fuel of prayer. Here he is talking about prayer again. Isn't it unfortunate that, that we have to continue to be reminded about those simple things in our life that make massive thing, differences? And I, I would say that, that today as I'm speaking, this may land, I'm praying that one of these three will land well with you. That like maybe for you, the running on fumes, it's, it's, maybe it's all three, but I'm praying that, that one of these three is what God would say, hey, th this is where you're at today. And maybe it's prayer. See, see, what's interesting about prayer is Max Licato said this, I love this. He says, our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble, feeble, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers make a difference. See, I, I met, I, being a pastor, you hear a lot of excuses of why people don't pray. And sometimes you understand. I, I don't want to pray because I'm not a good prayer. You know what's really cool about that? It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how waxed eloquent you are when you come before God and you impress God. Listen, your prayer and the power of the prayer is not based upon the one saying it, but upon the one that you're praying to. That it doesn't matter how you pray and what it looks like, as janky as it may be, when you pray, the one that hears it listens and begins to work on your behalf. Thank you, God. That means I don't have to like, shall, Lord, thou us be. You know, that, that, nah, we don't need that. We just come to God because the power is in the, not the prayer. The power is in the one that's being prayed to in God himself. James 5, 16, the prayer of a righteous person has great power. Matthew 6, 6, it says, when you go and you pray in your room, close your door, and then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. God rewards people who pray. So prayer is a dialogue. It's it's this conversation that, that I speak to God, but also that he speaks to me. It, it's twofold, right? And, and I think we, could, we, we understand that it's us speaking to God. In fact, oftentimes that's where we get stuck. Like our, our, our clutch gets stuck in me speaking to God. In, in fact, a lot of times prayer becomes a monologue in which God just talk, in which we, we just talk and talk and talk. You ever, you ever talk to anybody on the phone that, that you, you, uh, you'll talk to them and, uh, you, they're, they're, and then they're talking? And, and every once in a while you'll pick it up and say, uh-huh, and then you'll set it back down. Uh-huh, you go like do dishes, vacuum, take your dog out for a walk, say hi to the neighbor, come back, and you pick it up and they're still talking. I think sometimes that's how God feels. He's like, if you just be quiet, I can, I can say something to you. But a lot of people look at prayer as simply a monologue when it's an engagement, not just of me speaking to him, but also him speaking to me. And I would say this, that, that so many times uh, in church world, there's a whole collective thought about God doesn't speak today. To which I would say hogwash on that. That's not true. In fact, Dallas Willard says this, he said, if God doesn't speak today, then the greatest disservice we could ever do to people is tell them they can have a personal relationship with God. And, and you and I need to settle in our hearts that, that not only do I speak to God, but also God can speak to me. That we need to settle that. We, we need to not let people in our lives tell us or look oddly at us or other believers that, that have been trained differently than us that God doesn't speak anymore. He does speak. I'm telling you, there, there have been moments in my life that God, I've never heard God audibly, but man, if you could be as loud as what he could be, not audibly, that would be the moment. 
I could tell you story after story. One time uh, I was frustrated because 25 years old, no church is going to take a chance on, on, a, on a 25-year-old pastoring their church. Nobody is crazy enough to let a 25-year-old kid pastor their church. And as soon as I said that, I looked over, and on the light, as soon as I looked over, I was driving, I looked over, and on the license plates it said, be still. God spoke to me and said, be still and know that I'm God. I'm telling you, God speaks to us in ways, and I knew that I knew that I knew that God was telling me, I got this. You're worried about so many things. You be still, and you let me work in your life. Be still, yeah. And a few weeks later, a few months later, I can't remember, a church called me, and we went and pastored the church for seven years. It was great. God speaks to us. And we get to settle that 300 times in the NIV, in the New Testament, it says, and the Lord said. John 10, 27, it compares us to a sheep and him to a shepherd. And he says, my sheep, are his people, us, know his voice. We should know his voice, and we recognize his voice. So, so how do I hear God? That's a great question. That's what I want to spend a few minutes on. How do I hear God's voice? I want to give you six things that will help you. Number one is scripture. And that's why we call it God's word. Listen, if God never did anything else in our lives and said anything else, his word is enough. And so many people say, I want to hear God's voice, but they don't read his word. One person says, if you want to hear God, read the word out loud and you'll hear him speak. His word is so critical. His word is the defining mechanism of life. And, and, and sometimes, we, you know, people, what's cool is it's a policing mechanism for decisions in our life and for us to know we're on the right track. It's why his word is central. Because sometimes people say, well, God told me to do this. And I'm like, that's not what his word says. Yeah, but he told me. And I'm thinking God's will will never contradict God's word. Scripture is key, right? I don't, care, I don't care your feelings, your emotions, what you think. His word trumps everything. Number two, that's how he speaks. You want to listen to him? Listen to his word. Number two is desire. I, I, when I was, a, when I was a, a, a youth pastor, I was, we were in school and getting ready to, to go in youth pastor in Idaho, Rachel and I did. And, and my, my, I was able to purchase a 1972 Volkswagen bus. Yeah, baby. It was awesome. Still bitter that I don't have it. And my dream was, as a youth pastor, I was going to, uh, you ever seen those, I, I collect old lunch boxes, and they got handles on them, and, I, and I, my desire was to make it look like a drivable lunch box. I was going to put a handle on top, I was going to roll up with some spinners as wheels, with, open the doors, and there's bass, that's what I was going to do, and I was going to invite kids to go to lunch in the lunch box. 1972 VW, man, I was boss, I was Boom, shakalaka. But I, I gave it away. I know, stupid. And here was what I was thinking is, is at the time, there, there, there was a desire issue in my life because desire will cause us to do things that nothing else will. Since that moment, I've, had, I've been desirous of things that, that I didn't know that I learned simply because I had the desire, not the ability. And I'll tell you this, it's your desire not your ability that allow you to hear God's voice. When you desire him, that's when you'll find him. Because desire can give you things that ability cannot give you. Here's number three is awareness. God is speaking and we don't realize it. Read 1 Samuel 3, Eli and Samuel, a little boy and a, and a, and a priest. And, he, and he, this little boy kept hear, he kept hearing a voice. And, and, the pre, and the pastor realizes God's trying to talk to him. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, God wants to speak to you. He was hearing, God's voice was being spoken, but he had to train his ear to listen. See, God is, is speaking to you and you don't even realize it. The Bible says it, it, the creation declares the glories of God. He's speaking to you. Number four is uh, leaders and mentors. Uh, that God places us people that are leaders and mentors in our life to help us hear God's voice through spiritual counsel, through touching base with them. Also in church, like right now. Do you know that what I'm doing, the act of preaching is God speaking. You know when people come to me and say, did you like have my house tapped this week? 
because, man, you just read my mail. And I'm like, I'm not that good, but God is. And when I come, I don't do sermons. But I pray, God, will you speak to your people through me this week? That, that's what God, that, that's a speaker. This is not a speaker. This is not a TED Talk. This is heaven speaking to you through a vessel. That's what this is, right? This is, this, is, this is a divine element here of the preaching of God's word in the moment that God prophetically shows up to speak to his people. Here's the last one, or number five is promptings, an eternal knowing. Man, I just have this idea, there's this sense in me. And it happened to Simeon in the temple when he, when he was prompted to go to the temple and they brought Jesus. Jesus is a baby there, Luke 2, 27. Last one, six, is worship. God is attracted to worship. You want to find God, worship. I, 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 I love worship, man. There's been moments on the, on the road, I'll turn some worship on, I'll roll down the window, put the moonroof on, and I'm worshiping. That's what the moonroof's for, it's for worship. <laughs> In the middle of the interstate, middle of the highway, God is speaking to me because that's what worship does, it attracts him. You want to hear God speak, be a worshiper. You know, but more is going out of the tank than going in. These are rhythms here in our lives, prayer, fasting, and rest, Sabbath. In, 19, in 2015, there was a, a company called the Purple App that, that started. It was a business startup in California. And, and what's interesting is you ever woke up and, and got in the car and only to find that your, your car was on E and the gas light was on because your spouse used it the night before and didn't fill it up. And now you're like, I'm in trouble. Well, the Purple App now keeps this from happening. 2015, I'm not sure if they're around anymore, but what you would do is you would, you would click, um, I need gas, and in the middle of the night, as long as your car was available, they would put 10 to 15 gallons of gas in your night. You would go to bed with an E, wake up with an F. Or more fuel in your tank. Pretty interesting, right, concept. It, but one of the ladies said this, Stephanie 41 s- said this, and, and she says, um, it's so convenient. I'm always waiting to the last minute to fill the gas tank. So are you, by the way. Uh, and she says, in my head, it's such a waste of time to go to the gas station. You know, I'm going to be honest with you today. Everything that I'm saying, one would say, that's a waste of time. Sometimes it's why we don't do it. I don't fast. I don't have time to fast. I, I don't pray because I don't have time to pray. We feel that urgency of hurry. But, but I would tell you that, listen, you don't have time to not do these things. In fact, Martin Luther said, I have so much to do. The great reformer that took it and, and totally revolutionized church as we know it. He said, I have so much to do, i got to pray for an hour. Because he understood that when I abide in him, and his words abide in me, I'll produce fruit. That the lifestyle that I desire, that I truly want, effective, successful, making a difference, flowing in rhythm, having relational strength, being able to have favor, comes from these disciplines of being fueled in my life. He understood that. You can't, you can't not do these things, gang. There's exponential power. Let's turn to our connect card. Number one, today accept Jesus as my Savior for the first time. Maybe you're here today and you need to make that change. There's nothing like Jesus. Number two is, I'll, I'll, I love this. I read a book, did a series on it several years ago called The Unhurried Life by Alan Fadling. It's phenomenal. It's one of the best books on rhythm and Sabbath that I've ever read. It'll totally change your life. It'll encourage you. It'll make you more effective and a better believer. And in every area, it'll make you better. Number four, three rather. I feel the need and the urgency to fast this week. I'm facing something. I need, I need favor. I need to fast this week. Fast a day. Fast a meal. Fasting without prayer is a spiritual diet, by the way. It's fasting and prayer. They go together. Number four, I desire to hear God in the situation I'm currently facing. So what is God saying to you? Respond. Turn these in the back, okay? Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask our prayer team to come. Man, I love you so much, man. I tell you. I'm a recovering speed addict. How about you? I'm, I'm trying, gang. I want to figure this out, man. I, I want to, I, the Bible says those that endure to the end will be saved. I don't want to do well at the beginning and fizzle out at the end. I don't want to have a great marriage the first five years and it be in the junk hole the last ten. I don't want to be successful and have my kids hate my guts. I'm trying to figure it out. How about you? 
I'm, I'm not doing what, I, you know, I, I'm don't, don't, just don't send me email. We love, that's not the, that's not the point, but, but I need to do better in this. I'm just confessing to you. I'm trying to figure it out like you are, man. How does it, because we can find ourselves so tired in such a quick time. That's not the heart of God. God says, come to me. My, my yoke is easy. My, 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 my burden is light, man. It's so, that the rhythm of Christ is so different sometimes than what I feel. God, you, we, I need you to help me with this. How about you today? So let's pray. And, uh, man, if you need prayer today, I'm going to invite you to come. We're just going to worship, man. And um, if you're new with us, love to connect with you in the connect room. And, and uh, man, God's got this, though. I know, I know he's got this. So let's pray. And, man, and uh, when God's done with you, you're free to go. This is the, the benediction. Okay? Feel benedictized, okay? Just worship and let God do something deep in you. Father, we love you today. Thank you for your goodness. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. This is my
us your rest today. Give us your peace, your joy. Shake up the ground for all my tradition. Break down the walls for all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground for all my tradition. Break down the walls for all my religion. Your way is healthy, God. Your way is better for me. Do it.